Hello, so today I'm going to talk about cross-fostering in pigs. So, what is cross-fostering? Cross-fostering is a process of raising a piglet from one sow to a surrogate sow within the same farrowing group. And this is most often done for sows with larger litters to move piglets to a sow with like a smaller number of piglets. So, and how is cross-fostering done? Well, it's most often utilized like early on, so within like the first 48 hours or so. And the larger pigs should be the ones that are moved during cross-foster since they are more able to compete for milk. And a strong scent should also be put on the pigs that are going to be moved to help mask their scent from the fostered mom. And over here we have like a diagram of how it's usually done. So if, so the cells that have more piglets than they do like have teeth, they would be moved to a nursing sow that has just had a, that has just also had a litter like just slightly before, and then her piglets would then get moved to another like nursing mom, and then that nursing mom's piglets would then be they're old enough to be weaned, so kind of just like a little like conveyor belt of. Piglets getting moved from mom to mom. So, why is cross fostering beneficial? So, it reduces the thin litter weight variation, so the piglets become more like uniform in size. It helps prevent, uh, helps evenly match the number of piglets within the sow's ability to nurse them. Because, so like, of course, like how much milk they get is very important to like their grow size. So, and it has been found that 30% of the piglets that die have no milk in their stomachs. So of course, if you can reduce the amount of pigs that don't get milk, you can increase the amount that survive. And like I said, can increase the survivability of pigs with poor viability by 80%. So if the, if the little piglet's not looking too well, if you're able to get in enough food and like nurturement, then they have a much better chance of surviving. It also reduces overall stress on the sows and piglets. So it's just a better fitting. So there's also cross fostering is used a lot in like experiments and a lot of like observations that have also been done on cross fostering. So it's found that piglets form peat fidelity within <coughs> two days of birth, which means that each piglet usually has like a teeth that they go to or prefer over other teeth. And it's believed that this helps to prevent fighting and confusion during nursing. And as good as cross fostering is, if it's done poorly, then it can have negative effects. So in there was an experiment where twenty seven like litters of piglets, um, were mixed six times over 16 days, like during nursing. And after each weighing, which they were weighed like each time, like right before they were mixed, the heavier pig from the lightest litter and the lightest pigs from the heaviest litter were cross fostered. And this ended up causing increased fighting between the piglets. Um, the number of non-productive nursing periods with no milk meltdown was more frequent, and adopted piglets were 13% lighter than resident piglets, but both groups were lighter than the control group, which had no cross-fostering. So this increased amount of like cross-fostering had just an overall negative effect on the piglets. And cross fostering has also been used to like in experiments to help determine which specific traits were heritable or could be learned. So it's like if you take like a piglet from one mom and you see like the traits
from the new mom, you know, that's probably a learned trait. But if you see a trait that resembles, like, their birth mother, then you know that's probably a heritable trait. There are my sources. And we end with piglets. Yes. Excellent. Any questions? Now, is that PowerPoint? Um, Google what, Slides. What is it? Oh, Google Slides, sorry. I, I should learn Google Slides. That was kind of neat, but there's too many programs to learn, first of all. Man, this is going forever. Okay, questions, comments? I've got a few things to tell you about cross-fostering, but I'll, let's see if there's questions first. Okay, there's a question over there for you. More like a comment. Comment. So you guys mentioned how it was like mostly done in research, but I worked for Smithfield on a large production farm that was done all the time. Okay, describe how they did it. Because, uh, you know, Brianna said sometimes you move them once and then you move them twice, but in real world production, did they ever do that much? Um, I mean, it depends. Like the low viability pigs were euthanized, so you didn't really have too much of that. But if there were too many large pigs, they would move them, and it was done almost immediately. Was yeah. As soon as they could. And you would move them to uh, a litter where there was a teat or you know yeah. what it right, mm -hmm. um, and you could move them to different mothers. Oh, but did they ever move the like on that slide there? Did they ever move them again to another mother, or did they leave them on the original one that they took them to first? To my knowledge, they left them. Yeah, yeah. Like they would gather them from multiple, just kind of all put them on one right. if she had like a really little little. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I saw they moved one too late, or they didn't put enough stuff on it. The mother was super aggressive. Oh yeah, because uh, if you're not familiar with swine, those sows, given the right or maybe wrong circumstance, they'll eat the piglet. Yeah. I eat. Saw that, yeah, I bet you did. So then, what did you use for scent? Because I love this real world stuff. That's why we're here and take a pin. What do you guys use? Um, if they were new enough, like just out of the womb, they would use the placenta or or they would bird. rub the placenta yeah. on them. Kind of make them smell. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would just kind of grab some of the other piglets and put them on there. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you, you try to make everybody smell the same. Yeah. If she's nursing, you don't want like an oddball. So exactly. Everybody's got to smell the same. So does everybody get the placenta or if you use talcum powder or something, right? I mean, when you yeah. bring your one cross foster, you don't want that one just to smell because then it's easy to pick it up, right? So yeah, it's a real world thing. And if I've seen pictures where like, they'll let pi piglets nurse, right? And then as they're nursing, number them, like from left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like with some paint or crayon, and come back a couple days later, there they are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It kind of proves that point. Because they do, they have a certain one. Interestingly, I'll tell you a little experiment I was involved with uh, at Nebraska where we cross-fostered rats. There were three genetic lines of rats. Uh, it was something about growth. I, you know, it was long enough ago and it wasn't my main experiment, but there was like lean growth and they had something else. But there were three lines, I think it was ABC. I had to breed, with the help of the male rats, of course, 120 females, 40 from each genetic line. So my job in the morning was, you know, I put the male with the female, and then I would actually have to do a vaginal smear on each one and look for the presence of sperm under a microscope. So with a rat, whenever you see sperm, you've got pregnancy. You know, there's like hardly <laughs> ever fail. So then I would take the male away and then breed some more females, and I would end up with 40 pregnant on each line, 120 rats, giving birth, and they give birth to at least 10. So I would have over a 1,000 little pups. I had to sex them on the day of birth. And then we would cross foster from, like say, mother A. We would leave three of her pups, probably like two females and one male. But then we would give her three pups from each of the other two lines, okay? So a female that was nursing, she would have three of her own, let's say genetic line A, she would have three from genetic line B and three from genetic line C, okay? So what you set up for is you have a litter has all, everybody in the same uterus has the same what's called prenatal environment. But when you cross foster them, you put that genetic line into three different postnatal environments, see? So every mom was like say from genetic line A, but she had A pups, she had B pups, she had C pups. And it was a big genetic study, and I would, the only reason I got into it is I was doing reproduction. So then I 
determine when those rats came into puberty. Over a thousand, I determined when they had puberty. I probably bred them uh, and to see, I don't think I euthanized them when they were pregnant. I, I might have, but I can't remember because then you could determine ovulation rate. So I was doing what was called correlated responses to the geneticists. They were selecting for like rate of lean growth or whatever it was. And then they wanted me to do the reproduction, breeding. And it was amazing. Every morning I'd go in there. If I got a pregnant rat, then I'd put her down. I'd read her down. Because gestation length of a rat is 21 days. So, and puberty isn't much longer than that. A female is born. And you tell f puberty in the female rat because they would have a vaginal opening at the time of puberty. There's enough steroids made by the ovary. And in the male, the male rat has prepucial separation. That means until they reach puberty, you can't extend the penis out their sheath. So that's how you determined puberty. And then I'm sure I did ovulation rate with the males, probably way the testes, you know, all those things you can do in that. So when she said she was doing cross-fostering, it just brought back 